All right, so uh, the new album is out, came out end of April, uh, Better Days Coming. Uh, it's actually been five years since your guys' last release. Why Why so long of a wait in between uh, albums? Uh, because we're all another band. Well, I mean, I do classical music, but uh, Rod, Reb's in Whitesnake, John's in Starship, Rod teaches at Berkeley, and, uh, you know, I do a lot of solo stuff, so we're all really busy. So uh, this was really the first opening we had, actually. Now, how about that? Like, um, like this, this day and age now, where I mean, you guys all have different projects and all. And um, you know, back in the day, it was like unheard of. It was always, you know, it would be winger, and that was your focus. And it was kind of like almost like an unwritten rule, like you guys couldn't do these outside projects. It'd be like almost like frowned upon. Well, I mean, because you're so busy. I mean, we just, you know, when you have a when you have a record that you're pushing, and everybody, you know, you get a lot of comp- the record companies behind you and stuff. You know, you gotta gotta make it happen. I mean, it's the same in this case. It's just the first time we've had a chance to get together. You know, but I mean, this is the way it is now. I mean, if you look at right George Lynch or Doug Pinnock or you know the any of the guys, that, unless you're in a you know a really huge band that's always touring. I mean, everybody's doing side projects and stuff. So. Um, intellectual property is not worth anything anymore, man. You got to keep going. Like you got to work. Yeah. You got to play live. So I mean, it's a whole different landscape now. Now, but how about that? Like uh, you know, like back in the day, like you yourself. Um, I mean, you guys had that time where you guys were really big and uh, really busy. But deep down, did you ever have that want to do something beside the winger project itself at that time? Well, I mean, I started out as a solo act, so I've always had stuff going on, and I've always known that I wanted to write orchestral music, but it was just a matter of finding the time to tra- get tra- the proper training, really. Um, right. Um, we're all really diverse musicians. You know, we all – I don't know if I'm answering your question, actually. I mean, but <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, we're very interested in a lot of things. We This band is the nucleus of where we as individuals are coming from on, on the – in terms of rock, the rock level. I mean, for certainly for Reb, it's his band. You know, he writes half the stuff. So being in Whitesnake, he's playing David's songs, you know, so it's different. Right. It's a totally different animal, you know. But, um, you know, it's like I, I want to go off and do a lot of stuff, and, I, and so what's Reb going to do while well, I'm kind of going off doing my own thing? You know, of course he's going to go right. do another band. So And it's really, like I say, it's just the landscape of what's going on now. Now, how about um, off the new album? Any tracks that are like your personal favorite? Not really. I mean, I just write, you know, I write the songs. The songs tell me how to write them kind of once you get a good idea and they kind of lead you to the way they want to be. And then you just kind of, uh, you know, um, do your best at not screwing them up, basically. I mean, trying to trying to uh, bring a idea to its best conclusion, kind of, you know what I mean? Well, I, I got the uh, the CD the other day, and I've been listening to it, and um, the w- one song that really kept standing out to me, and I kept saying to myself, wow, this is just really a deep song, is Ever Wonder. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's... Uh... That's me and headed for heartbreak mode. You know, that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of tune that the the first opening melodic fragment, you know, kind of hit me, and I just was like, okay, how don't I fuck this up, basically, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I I really tried to. Uh, it's very for me, music writing, composing music is just. Um, you have to kind of touch the keyboard and then walk away. You know, you have to walk away a right. lot. Really. I mean, you, right. Do you, are you a musician? You sound like you're a musician. Yeah, yeah. I play a little bit of guitar, but uh, I suck at it. <laughs> well, I mean, so you get it. So it's like, you know, you you get – you just it, handling a good idea with great care is really the most important thing. Um, it's right. easy to believe in that all your ideas are great and all this kind of stuff, and it's like – it's that's the easy part. It's not easy to self edit and, and, and really try to be really sober about, you know, 
if the ideas really are good and live up to an inspiration because I mean, I don't care who you are, all best ideas come by accident. So no yeah. matter if you're Einstein, the idea is just going to fly into your head from the universe. You're never going to sit there and invent a great idea. It's just going to hit you. You know, so the, the the whole game is to try to ride the inspiration as far as you can before it fades away because it inevitably fades away. That's what music is. It's like trying to ride lightning. Right. And it's usually like in the shower when those good ideas come to you. <laughs> well, so in all kind of different ways. I mean, I've, I've actually trained myself to really not even think about it until I'm sitting down in my, where I can actually actualize ideas. But I do, I've trained myself to, you know, sit in a quiet space and hear things as much as I can. But, you know, when you do that, that's just training your brain to be ready for the idea when it comes. It's not, I could sit here and think of a big giant piece of music in my head and when I get it from my head to an actual manifested sound coming out of a guitar or a keyboard, it's nowhere near going to be the same. You know? Now, how about, like, the lyrics, though, for that song? I ever wonder, like, did, after you wrote that, did, did you, like, go back and look at those lyrics and be like, that that's pretty pretty deep, man. <laughs> well, it's, 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 bi it's autobiographical. So, I mean, I was very conscious in writing those words, and, you know, about... It's kind of, you know, betraying the ones you love and, and uh, you know, facing yourself. And as you get older, you're kind of wondering all the things that you thought about yourself, if they're true or if you're just bullshitting yourself, kind of. Right. So the lyrics, it's different for me with lyrics. I mean, I have to sit down and consciously think of them. And then maybe a line will pop in my head, but... I'm not a lyric-oriented writer. I, lyrics are very difficult for me, and I have to really work at it to make them valid. And I mean, I farm out a lot of the words, actually, at this point, because I don't really have many songs like Midnight Driver in me anymore. So, you know, I use I use a couple of very trusted lyricists to help me on stuff. Wow. Now, how about uh, also, too, like, you have uh, three videos off the new album, which... Personally, I was like, yes, because I feel like almost like you know today, it's even more important for bands to be making videos for their songs for promotional. With the whole uh, you know with YouTube explosion, I think I think it's more valuable now today than it was back in the day. I completely agree. So you know, we made five videos. There's a Better Days Coming video that not my favorite. Um, it's on the DVD package, and then we are still working on Queen Babylon, and we we actually want to do So Long China and Ever Wonder. Uh, we've got a lot of requests. I mean, I had a personal feeling to do Ever Wonder as a video, so right. um, I think YouTube's the whole game in music now. I mean, people want to go there and watch this, watch watch this stuff. You know? Yeah, it's funny because like like some bands I'll I'll interview, they're like. Uh... Like there's there's a, a kid band out of uh, New York area called Giffords Lane, and every time we've interviewed them, I mean these are like young kids, and they'll put uh, their new releases out. And they, every time I talk to them, it's like, yeah, we just released this on YouTube, and then they'll get like a million hits on it. And I just think to myself, like, wow, like this is gonna be like the way of the future. Everything's just gonna be like I released it. It already movie. is. Well, it already is the way of the future. It's the own game, dude. I mean, you can, and then you monetize, and there's a, it's the money is just. There's no money in the business anymore, really, to speak of, unless you're huge. So you right. got to go out and play live and and reach those million people that are hitting your hitting your hitting your channel. You know, I'm still catching up to the technology. I mean, I I'm an old geezer now, man. I'd, I'd you know <laughs> I'd, I'd be very content to sit in a one bedroom apartment in Paris and write string quartets. So, wow, um, keeping up with it all is is pretty intense. But it's you know it's cool and I like it because it keeps you young you know it keeps you going it keeps you vital and stuff. Now you, you speaking of uh, the classical music and uh, you did a classical album back in was it 2010? I did. I I wrote a ballet for for uh, San Francisco Ballet and I released the recording of it. Um, and then I wrote another piece, full 
full symphony that's yet to be released called uh, Conversations with Bajinsky. And uh, I'm getting ready to work on a solo record, another solo record, and, um, you know, hopefully not let five years go by between now and the next Wing Around, although Dave, uh, Reb's very busy with David Coverdale working on a new project now. So, you know, we're lucky to be working, basically. I was going to say, how do you like, uh, like when you come up with songs, do you sit there, you write a song, and is it pretty instant, like, uh, all right, well, this will be for Winger, or this will be for myself? Oh, um, um, I never do that. Reb and I sit down, and we, you know, we write. Well, like, if we're going to make a record, we don't come in with any new ideas. We sit down and we write this thing. Like, Karma was written in 10 days, a song a day, in the order that you hear them. Wow. Uh, this one was written over a period of about six weeks. And, you know, we just come, you know, Reb's a great riff meister, and I can supplement riffs real well, and then I arrange the stuff. And, and it's pretty fast because we're really, you know, we've been together a long time, and we know, you know, we know where we're going and we know now what we are, you know, that's, that was the biggest thing. There was a lot of years where we didn't really know what we were. Right. So as as a band, we really know what we are. And so this album really exemplifies what we are. It's got a little bit of everything that we've ever done and it's balanced in a way that shows, okay, this is swinger, you know, that's what this band is, you know? So, um, you know, we're archaic in some ways, and we're kind of modern in other ways. You know, I mean, uh, by today's standards, it's not a he- it's not a heavy band. I mean, if you listen to some of the really death metal and stuff, I mean, that's you know, that's really the heavy shit. So, but we're not yeah. a pop band. You know, we're like a, we're like a straight down the middle, like classic rock band. And that's sure. Really now, you guys are also getting ready to go. To, uh, I think this weekend, playing over in uh, England, starting with the Download Festival. That's right. Yeah, we're lucky to get on that show on the main stage. We're, you know, we're doing four shows in the UK after that, and then come back here, do more shows, and then I've got a performance with the ballet in Paris in July. I'm going back for that, and then coming back here, oh, wow. more shows in August, and then I go back to Europe for solo shows in September. Now, how, another thing is like, to me, it seems like Europe just totally accepts. Um, way, just way more than the states do nowadays. Um, as a c- audience, crowd response, uh, in general, just the bands of uh, you know back of our era. Well, I mean, you know, that's true. Especially back in the day, it's true. They're not as fickle as American fans. But nowadays, man, the internet has opened this whole thing up. So a lot of times, like you know, we just played in Dallas. We had a lot of young fans singing all the new music. Nice. We're not a big band, you know. We don't draw thousands of people, you know. We're kind of like a fine wine <laughs> that, you know, uh, a- that ages gracefully, but we don't draw a lot of people, man. You know, we, we, but the people that we do draw know every single song that we do, and they're really, you know, they're really into it. So, you know, we're right. lucky to have that. Um, I'd like to build the audience base, but I doubt it's going to happen, just because. Um, you know, it's kind of set in stone what we are, you know. So, unless I had like a Brett Michaels reality show or something like a like a, <laughs> a you know a Duck Dynasty, uh, you know, yeah, right. that's really the way. That's really the way to make it now, you know. So we're just about focusing if, on. How, yeah. Would you do that? Would you, if you were offered some type of reality show, would you do reality TV? I turned down a bunch of them. I'd do the right one. I don't know. I mean, I don't mind. It would have to be the right show. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to just. I'm not looking. I'm not looking to be famous just to be famous, dude. I mean, that's not what I'm in it for. You know, I'm yeah, in this I, to understand. I'm in this to understand music and all about the music. Now, another thing is too, and you talked about this years ago, was that you know the whole Beavis and Butthead thing and all that. But, you know, it's funny because I was kind of thinking about it. I was saying to myself, like, you guys kind of get, like, the last laugh now because, I mean, you guys are still going. You're still making incredible music. And really, you don't hear no more Beavis and Butthead. 
It's true. It's really true. I mean, I like I say, a lot of young fans are coming to the shows, and 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 uh, once the internet has removed the prejudice and people are listening to our music for what it is, you know, and that's kind of what's going down. A lot of the what I see is that I mean, you got to keep moving and you got to keep learning and stuff. A lot of bands, um, I won't mention any names. Um, you know, they write the same song over and over and over again, thinking they're going to relive the past, and you just can't do that, man. I mean, you got to yeah. keep it fresh. I'm not yeah. saying that we're the greatest band in the world, so don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, you know, we're no Led Zeppelin, because that era in the 70s is when the business was being invented. So the creativity level, I mean, it's the creativity level is probably the same now, but back then no one heard it before. Like, if I put right. Better Days Coming out, and it came out in 73... I mean, it'd be like, what? You know, <laughs> those guys were the ones inventing it. So, right. But I think, you know, we stay fresh. We keep trying to learn. We keep trying to get better. And I'm not saying other bands don't do that. I'm just saying that what I hear is that a lot of my, I'm talking about the bands from my era. You know, I hear, sure. Even the big, even the big ones, I, I you, you hear this stuff and it's like a lot of it just sounds the same, you know. Now, how about uh, you're also t- like you live in Nashville now? I mean, Nashville is like becoming just the complete mecca of music. Like everybody I talk to anymore, they're like they're living in Nashville. Yeah, it's a great music town. That's why. I mean, there's a lot of people. People, uh, you know, they come here because there's a lot of studios. There's a lot of musicians. There's a lot of record companies. A lot of publishers. You know, it's really. The work ethic is astoundingly high, and people are hungry as hell. You know, they're really, you know, this is the place. So, I mean, I, Bob Ezrin lives here. I just cut a bass part for him on a new Alice Cooper project. I mean, you know, it, it's, oh, cool. it's happening. I'm not a huge fan of the South. Um, I'm a Western guy from Colorado, and, the, and it gets a little too hot in the summers here for me. But, you know, all in all, Nashville... Uh, for the, I mean, there's nowhere in the world with a small with a wide a smaller uh, circumference of talent. I mean, it's just it, it's astounding, absolutely wow. off the hook. Yeah. Now it was funny too because uh, when I started promoting that you were going to be on the show this week, um, I don't know if you remember remember the old Glow Wrestling from the '80s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had uh, we've had a few of them girls on our show, and uh, one of the girls, uh, Roxy Astor, she was like. Oh my God, Kip Winger! I love him. So make sure you tell him I love him. So I had to make sure I got that in there for Roxy. Uh, that's what's her name, Roxy? What? <laughs> Roxy Astor. Well, we'll tell her I said hi. <laughs> now, how was that like back in the day too, dealing with the whole heartthrob thing that you got pigeonholed into? Oh, um. You know, that's just part of the show. It's part of show business. I mean, you know, you can't you can't dictate to the fans what, or the, to the to the world at large who you are. You know, they have they're going to decide and they're going to compare you, and then all that stuff that went down with Beavis and Butthead and all that stuff. I mean, that just did that just did what it did. I mean, it put us in a certain place, and uh, it was just one of those things that happened. So was, there are a lot of people. Be, gained prejudice against us and kind of misunderstood. They, they weren't looking at what was under the hood, kind of, you know. So Right. Um, it's just the way it is. I mean, you know, we've, we, we're we still playing live. We don't, you know, we we don't solicit gigs. People come to us. And so uh, just in, in making, I've always lived free. I've never had a boss. And I, you know, I mean, I can't complain, you know, I really I've just uh, been able to write my own movie, and and uh, I've had some ups and downs, and you know, but I'm no different than anybody else. Cool. And and how about I, I got to ask this too uh, on the Midnight Driver of a Love Machine video? Whose Corvette is that? Is that anybody's? Uh, is that your Corvette by chance? <laughs> no, no, no. That was just the video video stuff. But I. That's one. I think that might be one of my favorite songs on that record. I just I love the vibe of it, and we gave a nod to Kiss on Detroit Rock City on the opening with the car, you know. Right. Yeah, it was kind of funny because I, I saw that and I was and I started laughing because back, uh, you know, I, was, I guess when the first album was out, I, I had a Corvette. I was 18 years old, and your first, the first album was like heavy rotation on my tape player back in the Corvette back in the day. That's awesome. 
<laughs> so, all right, well, I guess that's about it. Uh, before I let you go, though, if I can just get you to cut a quick ID. Uh, you know, this is Kip Winger, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. Hey, this is Kip Winger, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. Cool. Thanks a lot, man. Good luck with everything, and have fun over at the Download Festival. Nice talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Take care.